Joining us now in studio is Anita Vandenbelt. She's a former country director for the National Democratic Institute in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Nice to meet you and have you in that chair tonight. Nice to be here. Well, just start by telling us what the National Democratic Institute is and does. Yes, it's a Washington-based democracy promotion organization, an NGO, that has country offices in about 70 countries around the world, working on things like elections, political parties, parliaments. So you went over there for them? I, I did, to yes. To keep an eye on we, things? We reopened the office there. Um, we were working on a political party project to encourage dialogue between the ruling party and the opposition parties. And you were there during the November elections? I was indeed. Uh, what did you hope to accomplish while you were there? Well, the, the hope was that we would be able to, to work with the parties in order to make it a truly competitive election, uh, to build the capacity, and also to work with the election commission in order to ensure that the, at the end, in the end result, that the election would be fair and it would be accepted by all of the political parties. Uh, all of the political parties, which is how many? Uh, over 400, 426 in the 426. end. 426. It's, um, well, th and this is why we wanted to work with the parties, because there, if you have a disagreement with someone in your party, you just start another one. Hmm. And so there isn't really that, that basis of organization. Leading up to the election, I presume they don't have public opinion polling or anything. No. So did you have a sense about which way it was going to go? I think that there was on the ground, uh, particularly in Kinshasa, which is where I was, um, a capital city. Very, yes, the capital city of over 10 million people, uh, a very strong sense of dissatisfaction. Um, there was, it, it wasn't clear, of course, because we weren't present around the country, but the, the sense was that some of the opposition parties would do quite well, particularly in, in the major cities. Was there a difference between what you were hearing from sort of diplomatic community sources versus person on the street? Yeah. yeah. How so? Um, I, what I found actually, and we, we actually brought the parties together, the, the Majority Presidentielle, which is the ruling party coalition, along with the opposition parties every week. And so we got a really strong sense of some of the issues and tensions that were emerging. And what I found often was uh, when I was talking to the diplomatic community, the, the term I heard most often was assez bien. Okay, the elections aren't going to be perfect, I but as bien, long as they're good enough. Good enough. And I, I think that that was a miscalculation. I, I think that many in the international diplomatic community, not so much the international NGOs, um, miscalculated the depth of the sentiment of the population, and just thought, well, we'll just we'll we'll let these elections go. If there's some problems, it's not going to be that bad. Hmm. And. That, I think, is one of the reasons why it got as bad as it did. Now, this is one of those countries that the world frequently turns a blind eye to officially, diplomatically. So who's, when you talk about diplomatic sources there, who's actually there? Uh, well, there's, there's a lot of interest in uh, DRC in terms of um, the, the embassies that are present. You've got all the major, the major embassies, Canada, of course, uh, the U.S., France, Britain, um, China. There, there's a tremendous amount of interest because of the, the business, because of the mining, because of the resources. In terms of mineral resources, this is considered probably one of the richest countries oh, in the world. We're going to go into all this during <laughs> the debate. I know there is so, so much uh, but, um, money but, to be made there. Yeah, and, and there are some NGOs. Um, there are a lot of human humanitarian aid organizations, um, and very few democracy organizations. In fact, NDI was the only one that was working with political parties. Hmm, how come? I think not how very come, much... Not how come you were there, but how come so it, few others? Um, well, it's a good question. It's a very good question. I think in some ways it's, it's Africa, and we tend to have a bit of a double standard when it comes to democracy in Africa. Um, I, I think that there was a reluctance to work directly with the political parties because they were considered the problem. Um, so we don't want to work with these corrupt parties or uh, self-interested. And in doing so, I think we really did a disservice. Hmm. I don't want to exaggerate this or anything, but, but you know, almost all of what I've seen from the Congo is awful. You know, what, what you see reported on television. When you're there, do you fear for your life? Not personally. Um, we didn't take any, any risks. Um, of course, when I left, the Canadian government, the Canadian embassy had, had urged Canadians to leave while there were still commercial flights. Um, it is a place where 
for people who are active, for human rights advocates, for women's advocates, for opposition political leaders, it can be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten worse since the election. I've talked to some of the women that we were working with in our program who've been beaten black and blue by, by the security forces, and several people who've just disappeared. Uh, the security forces go to their home in the night, and they're never seen again. And so I w was more concerned for the safety of our partners, of the people we were working with. Um, as, a, as an international NGO, I think that, you know, of course, you can be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But, you know, I myself never really worried, also because we were working so well with both the opposition and the ruling party. So I don't think there was anybody who would specifically have targeted us. They trusted you as a kind of fair, neutral yeah. observer. Yeah. Take a look at the monitor over my shoulder here, because we're going to go through a series of photos here. And I'd like you to just walk us through them and sure. tell us what we're seeing. Michael, if you would, let's start to bring these up. Okay, take it away. What are we seeing? This is the women's campaign school that uh, that we ran and I, I taught at. And so they're all candidates? They're all candidates, okay. yeah. And uh, it was phenomenal. And, and one thing, I think we'll talk about women later in the program, mm -hmm. but women in Congo, when you think of that, you think of victims. But the women I encountered were articulate, they were strong, they were determined, very, very powerful women. And only 12% that ran, uh, even fewer that it looks like that they're going to win. But they were very eager to, to learn. It was That looks like a ballot. What's this? That, yes, actually, there were 18,500 candidates for <laughs> 500 positions. So uh, this is a picture I took of one of the ballots. It's like a broadsheet. It's like a newspaper. And the largest was 56 pages. <laughs> so if you're campaigning, you have to say, um, I'm on page 37, candidate number 1,426. So, well, I like the fact their pictures are there. Their ballots are yeah. better than ours in some respects. Oh, well, in that sense, especially because the level of education um, and literacy is, is sometimes low. So you had the party logo and the photo. Okay, next one. Uh, this is the voters list. And if there was a moment where, where the international community should have spoken up, it was six months before the election when they closed the registration for voters because already you were seeing the trend toward the fraud that was going to occur. You saw areas where the opposition was strong, where they closed the offices early, they intimidated people from getting on the list. You had several, uh, some of the, the people that worked with the election commission were saying up to 1.5 million voters that really didn't exist hmm. that were on the list. So um, people would frequently go look at the list and they wouldn't find well, the Well, the problem was they were supposed to, according to the election law, post the list at every polling station 30 days before the start of the campaign. And they did it the weekend before. Hmm. Okay, next image that we're going to take a look at is right there. Ah, uh, yes. This, I think the thing that we should recognize about these elections is the enthusiasm of the Congolese people for the election. They lined up for they, hours. They, they wanted to vote. They walked. Sometimes you had a mother with four kids who walked through the mud and the rain just to go to vote and only to be told she wasn't on the list, go to another polling station, come back the next day. And that picture there was uh, people holding their voting cards saying, please let us vote. Hmm. Okay, next picture. Hmm. This, this was the counting center. And as you can see, it looked like a refugee camp. Yeah. It's uh, very disorganized. If there was a, a problem, I think it didn't happen so much at the polling station, but when the results were compiled and counted. We were walking on ballots. We were literally I trampling. Say, this does not look that it was, official or no, organized. And they lost about 3,000, the results of about 3,000 polling stations. That's about 1.3 million votes lost. The ballots just can't be found, and almost entirely in opposition strongholds. Uh, this was the one in, Kin <laughs> in Kinshasa in particular. So. At what point did you start hearing that there were irregularities, let's call them that, with the way things were going? Um, if you look at the process, it, I would say it started even very, several months before. Uh, they, the election commission was changed from a neutral commission to one which was politicized. You had three from the majority and two from the opposition. And the head of the election commission was a, a cousin of the incumbent president. They changed the constitution. A constitu blood relative, wasn't it? Yes. Um, you had a, a change in, um, in the constitution, which changed it from the president having to get 50% in a second round to a single round system, which of course would make it easier for the incumbent president, Kabila. Um, you had problems with the voter registration, you had delays, logistical, it's a huge country. In some places with these ballots being this thick, imagine the volume. Mm -hmm. And they had to, some places, carry it on their heads or on bicycles or in boats in order to get it to some of these villages. But there were foreign observers from lots of countries around the world that, that were there yeah. on the ground to try to help make this thing yeah. go more smoothly. Did they have any influence? 
Uh, well, the foreign observers that were there, particularly the Carter Center, ha actually came out afterwards. It's Jimmy Carter's organization exactly. in Georgia. Exactly. Yeah, and they're very, they, they have a strong reputation on election observation. And they said afterwards that the election lacked credibility. The Catholic Church, which is the one institution in the country that is actually present, I mean, in a country where you don't have a strong central government presence, um, the Catholic Church really steps in in many cases, had 30,000 ob observers. Usually, the Catholic Church will stay out of politics and guard the, the, the separation. The cardinal said after the election, it lacked truth and it lacked justice. Hmm. So most, and the European Union as well, they said their observers on the ground were marking what the results were, but when they saw the official results that came out, these results had no bearing on what their own observers saw. Now, the 40-year-old incumbent president, Kabila, basically said, this is the result of the election, I'm still in. The 79-year-old opposition leader said, no, we don't recognize this election. Uh, everybody in the population stay tuned to me for further details. Yeah. And he actually said, I'm going to try to, you know, I don't know if he said I'm going to try to form a government, but he basically said, I'm a government in waiting. Yeah, yeah. Where's all that at today? Uh, it's still, it's still where, where it was. The opposition leader, uh, Etienne Chesekedi, is essentially under house arrest. They've got presidential guard all around his neighborhood and around his house. And um, so he can't leave the house. He did uh, have an inauguration. Um, I think for most of the partners we worked with, most of the Congolese, they do believe they elected Etienne Chesekedi as president. Um, we went to a gas station and the fellow said to me, you know, we elected Chesekedi, but you gave us the other guy. And, you being Western, uh, Western people. Well, they think the West um, I, there's conspired a strong sense, to keep the guy in. There's a strong sense of that. I, I wouldn't go that far. I think that, if anything, what Western diplomats did was look the other way. And I think now there's a lot of hand-wringing going on because it's become so obvious that, at best, we don't know who won. And mm. according to most of the people on the ground, they believe that the opposition candidate actually, if all the ballots had been counted would have would have won the election. Okay. Um, Just to uh, but one last thing before we broaden our discussion, invite the others to join us as well. You pointed out Ottawa's there, right? We have a presence on the ground in this country, which is the size of two thirds of Europe. It is a mass a massive country. What should we be doing there now? I think we have a tremendous moral authority. And if Canada were to come out and say what everybody is saying, which is, yes, these elections were, in essence, fraudulent, but what do we do about it? And say, we have got to ensure that there's a legitimate government that reflects the real will of the people of Congo. If that means holding the elections over again, there's a provincial election scheduled in March, then maybe that's the way it's going to have to be. But to let it sit with all these allegations of fraud, with the, the sentiment that you have right now, we have always promoted democracy. But if we turn around now and say, well, it doesn't count there. Have That's we recognized Africa. the results of this election? No. no. And, and in fact, even uh, you know, up until now, most of the, the governments, Western governments, have said there were clear problems with the election. So we haven't recognized the results, but we haven't gone so far as to tell them, do it again. And that's because the, the one appeals process was through the Supreme Court in Congo. And the Supreme Court was stacked by the incumbent president. So within, I think it was two days, not even, that they, that they deliberated. And they said, yes, these elections stand. Should we just shut our embassy down and leave? No, absolutely not. Um, I, I think that the presence of the international community is probably needed more now than it ever was. But we also, in good conscience, cannot say, on the one hand, these elections were not fair, and on the other hand, but we're just going to do business as usual. Understood.